Welcome to Sparks of History. Joining us today is David Frum, noted political commentator, former speechwriter for President George W. Bush, and current senior editor at The Atlantic. Thank you, Mr. Frum, for being with us today. We appreciate it very much. Thank you for the hospitality. Okay. Just to get started, are, are you surprised by the alarming rise in anti-Semitism in America today? And do you see additionally a, a fundamental shift in attitudes towards Israel and even towards Jews among younger Americans, especially as seen recently on college campuses? Um, I think we have a new cultural style of confrontation, but I wonder whether we're seeing as much of a shift. I think people project a, an imaginary golden age uh, into the past that, that was never there. Um, I, I, I hope I'm going to quote this exactly, but I, I remember reading, I was at one point doing a big reading project on the history of uh, po post-war Germany. And uh, the American occupation authorities ran surveys uh, of all kinds of aspects of Ger West German opinion. And one of the surveys was, and this would have been conducted in about 1946, do you think it's, uh, it's time for the Jews to get over the Holocaust. And uh, a, a substantial majority of West Germans in, in 1946 thought, you know, after 12 months, it had been enough already. Um, there is a clip of Mike Wallace in um, the early 1960s, before the Six Day War, interviewing the then eminent historian um, Arnold Toynbee, really kind of a crackpot, but a huge deal at the time. And uh, Toynbee warned before the Six Day War, that Israel's aggression against its neighbors threatened to dissipate the goodwill that had been accumulated because of the Holocaust. I mean, so this is that, that there was never, there was never a period, this idea that there was some period in the past when the idea of Jews having agency and a state of their own was broadly accepted. Um, I'm not sure that that was, that was ever true. Um, and despite the horror and suffering we see and um, the shock to the state of Israel and the Jewish people worldwide and the atro atrocities inflicted on so many, um, I do see the story of modern Judaism and modern Israel as one of going from strength to strength, not one of a some lost golden past uh, of permission uh, and some falling off in the sad, sad present day. And so what are we seeing on the college campuses? Are, are you saying that this is the norm? It just it just exploded or that it's really just a minority in any case. So it's 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 not as bad as it appears. Um, what I'm struck by is whenever I see a clip of really bad behavior um, and th there was a clip just yesterday, of the, the, the son of um, uh, 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 anyway, I won't, I won't use names, but there, there, is, there is a clip just yesterday of a man in, um, uh, in an Israeli flag confronting a masked Palestinian protester. And, and what I was struck by was that, the, that this person, this Palestinian who was simultaneously doing sort of like tough guy bro in a bar bit, still had his phone out and was recording the whole thing. And I think a lot of what we're seeing is not that the attitudes are so different, but the behaviors are changed for the social media age. People are generating for their own fantasies of fame and glory um, these viral moments for themselves, and that changes the behavior. I mean, one of the things, I mean, if I were more sympathetic to the cause than I am, uh, I would say to these protesters, you understand that your behavior is completely counterproductive, um, that if you're not changing any minds, you're looking like jerks. Um, vandalizing libraries, creating these incidents, how is this helpful? And what they would say is, um, well, you're recommending to us respectability politics. Like that's the worst thing in the world. You know, you want us to be like the civil rights movement with our church, um, church clothes and our neatly printed signs. So, well, as, as a matter of fact, that movement was quite successful in their church clothes and neatly printed signs. But the point is you're not interested in changing the world. You're interested in generating video of themselves. So I think, yes, the behavior is definitely more spectacular, more theatrical, more menacing, worse. Um, but it's also very self-destructive, and it's about chasing social media clout, not changing the world. I just note, well, one more thing I want to say. Yeah, please. Um, that um, this, this terrible conflict with so much suffering on all sides has been going on now 
for we're near it's for past two months and nearing three. And in these three months, um, in which Israel has done more or less exactly what Israel believes it needs to do to defend itself, it's had the total permission not only of the United States but of the European Union. That is, the, the, the two blocks of power that have mo that most mad with Israel have not raised any interference to anything that Israel has done. There has never been a grant of permission like this to Israel before, not in the 1982 Lebanon war, not in 1973, uh, certainly not in 1967, that Israel has always had a very tight time limit. This time, despite all that you're seeing on your social media screens, the most powerful states in the world, or at least those most relevant to Israel, are saying you can do what you want for as long as you need to do it. Um, and I, I think people should be aware of that extraordinary achievement. And, you know, yeah, TikTok, the TikTok battlefield, Israel's not doing so great. The actual battlefield, Israel's doing very powerfully. Okay. And, and on the university campuses, you know, such a hullabaloo with the three university presidents, one that was forced to resign. Again, is that indicative of, of anti-Semitism or is that more, again, this whole cultural woke DEI phenomenon? Yeah, look, look, there, there has been, in a lot of ways that, that are measurable, um, a, a, an ideological shift that began about the year 2014, maybe a little earlier. Um, and a lot of people argue about what exactly caused it and why it happened, but you, you can see it happening. I and mean, you can see um, uh, um, a radicalization of uh, the academy, um, a shift from the academy, has, as long as I've been alive, has been a pretty liberal place, but also the place where scholarship independent scholarship was valued and for sure there's been this um, shift toward activism there's been this huge expansion in the number of administrators who all need to find things to do um, i think there, there's somebody's calculated the university of california system the, the greatest of the state systems has no more professors today than it did 40 years ago um, it's had this huge explosion of administrators and uh, the administrators do lots of things. Some of them are coach, assistant coaches to sports. But, uh, but uh, this DEI project is a big driver of employment and a big changer of what's going on on the campuses. So there's a problem. And uh, the Harvard comedy is an example of this, where, I mean, somebody who probably would, if you were a Harvard undergraduate, would be expelled, would be suspended, maybe expelled, uh, is Harvard president with the university rallying around her. So that's... Um, upsetting, but also funny. So that's a, that's a different kind of thing. Um, and, and Jews are among the targets and victims of this change. But as we focus on this, and I don't want to say it's not important, I think we also need to focus on what it has mattered, what it has meant to have the power of the United States government and the power of the governments of the U European Union and Great Britain um, so solidly behind the state of Israel. Um, as the author of the Axis of Evil under the Bush administration, um, which included Iran, North Korea, and the third power was at that point Iraq. Iraq, of course. Okay, so is is there a new axis of evil today? Where does Israel fit in into that? Is this a new geopolitical environment so different from those years? Well, um, First, I want to stress um, that uh, a speechwriter is a servant, uh, not a principal. Um, and a, a speechwriter is not, um, you're a drafter, but you're not an author. Okay. Uh, and I think that's, uh, and I, it's really important. And, and speechwriters often get in trouble uh, when they, uh, you know, they all have this fantasy. There's going to be like this West Wing scene where they march down the corridors and confront the president and say, you say that, like, no, your job is to help him be the best him. And you will lose your mind if you fail to understand that you are, you are a servant. As, as James Baker, the greatest chief of staff ever used to say, staff are staff. Um, and <laughs> never forget that. Um, the point servant, of the, the servant, the pleasure of the president. Yes. Yes, or uh, <laughs> an exit at the, at the slightest displeasure of the president. <laughs> um, so I think you need to have a very clear view of your place in the scheme of things. Um, the argument of that section of that speech was to say, um, you know, the democracies have a network of formal alliances. 
Um, there is a NATO, there is the Quad, there, there, there are all these, uh, uh, there's NORAD, there, there are all these instrumentalities for a collective um, action, collective security, the sharing of information, true cooperation, because these are decent countries and, um, and they care about each other and they look out for each other and they have common interests. So the world's outlaw regimes can't form alliances. Because they're bandits. They, 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 I mean, they're, they're at war with the world. They're at war with their own people. None of, and none of them can ever make a commitment that anyone can trust, including you know, their partners in crime. So there are no alliances among the world's rogue regimes. There are the, but there are these opportunistic combinations. And, you, and what we're trying to describe in, back then was, this is a long ago world, but I, I, it, was, it, it, it was a smart thing to say. You would go on TV and see people say, it was impossible that Iran could arm Hamas because Hamas, after all, was Sunni and Iran was Shiite and they would never cooperate. And that was in 2002. That was, I mean, there, at that point, the intelligence proving Iranian support for Hamas was mostly classified. In fact, almost entirely classified. Um, and it was intensely controversial. And it was considered a smart thing to deny Iran Hamas cooperation. It was considered an intelligent thing to say there could be no way that Iran and North Korea were swapping Iranian weapons to uh, nuclear technology for North Korean missile technology because one was Stalinist and the other was Muslim. And so they would never cooperate. That had to be true. It was not possible that Syria and Iraq were cooperating uh, and sharing information and secrets, you know, because it, because it was, these were ad, ideological a priori insistences. And there's a lot of information at the time that they were doing so. And there, uh, and the story of A.Q. Khan from uh, Pakistan, who was, who was like the Johnny Appleseed of nuclear secrets and trying to sell nuclear technology to Al-Qaeda. And nothing really came of that. But he, that was not for lack of trying. And so what we're trying to communicate was that there are these regimes around the world, these terror groups around the world. They don't trust each other. They're not friends. They don't share goals. They're all criminals but they can selectively cooperate in ways that threaten the peace of the world. And so you need to be, not exaggerate the degree of cooperation, but also be mindful that the cooperation is happening. Um, and that, now I wanna say something else about how speeches work. When I drafted that language, I had no idea who the, what the names would be. Because that was not very, I mean, my, the question of who to name, mm -hmm. that was a presidential decision because this information was all secret. So, so when I wrote states like these and their terrorist allies, I had no idea what states the president would choose to name. As people would say, you, would, you chose North Korea to have a non-Muslim state. I didn't choose any states. <laughs> I, created, I created the framework of the language that other people could say, okay, well, you, know, you will name who you want to name in this speech. And today, if, 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 if you had to write the speech and and a president said, "I, I want to have a framework that that you know describes the relationship between you know these right. terror regimes and countries." It's, it, we see the same thing today. So um, Iran and Russia have obviously a highly opportunistic relationship. Um, China and Russia have an opportunistic relationship. North Korea and Russia have an opportunistic relationship. Um, and and terror groups. I mean. Uh, I, I had um, the honor of getting sort of a, a briefing the other day um, on the relationship between the Iranians and the various terror regimes they sponsor. And it's, it's, it's highly individual. Like they, they have varying degrees of control over each one. And even the regimes they control, even the terror groups they control the most, like Hezbollah, not everything Hezbollah does is, Iran can forbid, but it doesn't order. Um, or, and, and also the people at Hezbollah, often they make, if, if Iran hasn't thought to forbid something, there are a lot of things they will do that the Iranians may not like. Ne Iran never said no, so they sometimes have initiative at the local level. You know, one of the, uh, and so this, these are all things that we need to keep in mind. That these relationships are unstable, they're opportunistic, um, and um, terror groups can often drag their sponsors into conflicts that the sponsor may not have wanted. That may have been what happened with Hamas, for example. I, I, it remains you know, pretty unlikely that Iran may have had some inklings or maybe not. It looks pretty unlikely that Iran ordered it. Um, in fact, it looks very unlikely that Iran ordered it. Hamas did this on its own. And some of the Hezbollah actions seem to be taken more or less independently. So we need a way to think about these things that is, that understands that the relation, there are relationships, they matter. These, these groups would wither independently, but they, there, there's no, 
Dr. Evil Conference Board, where they coordinate their activities. Uh, just in, in conclusion, you, you had uh, struck a note of, of somewhat optimism as it, in regards to, to Israel going from strength to strength. Are you optimistic, number one, about the future of American Jewry? And are you also optimistic of, about the future of the state of Israel? Both. Profoundly optimistic about both. Um, and uh, the state of Israel, I, I think it's like Bilam's prophecy. I mean, just like, uh, you know, uh, e every day, if you read the Israeli press, you remember the joke about the, the, the Jew on the park bench who's reading the Nazi newspaper? And, and, and uh, the, <laughs> besides, why are you reading that trash? So well, look at you, you're reading, you're reading forward. And in the forward, what do I see? Pogroms, massacres, suffering, oppression, uh, people being driven out of business by boycott. In this paper, I read, we control the media, we control the Hollywood, the banks. I prefer good news. Um, so, uh, but there is this thing where, you know, the, the, the structure of Israeli life, um, you know, it's a free society with a free press. And so there's a lot of complaining. Um, and there's a lot of focusing on the, and that's how the self-correcting process of democracy is. You focus on the flaws so you can fix them. Um, non-democratic regimes, you know, it's always, you know, one military parade. Our army is the greatest in the world. And then it gets torn up in battle with the Ukrainians. Um, democracies are highly self-correcting. But you look decade by decade by decade. And I've been visiting Israel since the 1970s. Richer, stronger, more confident, happier, um, uh, more, more connected to the world than ever before. And as for American jewelry, um, you know, you could, uh, you know, you can, uh, there are a lot of things to worry about. Um, and it is, I, I am just struck how many of the people in the worst groups on campuses have Jewish names. And so you can look at that and say, oh my God, there, 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 there's someone's grandparent who is suffering very, very badly today. <laughs> uh, but then I think, okay, there's that. Uh, but my, my wife is a convert to Judaism. My three children are raised as Jews and, and are all active in the Jewish community. Um, and I remember when um, the rabbi who did our conversion, he said, our imports are always better than our exports. So uh, I think, and what I think is happening again and again is um, that the American Jewish community is is more it, 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 the boundary between Jews and non-Jews is blurrier than it used to be. There are many people who are there are many Jews who are sort of on the way out of the community, and there are many non-Jews who are sort of connected to the community. Um, and uh, but I think these are these. It's a different kind of strength than the strength the community would have had half a century ago. But it is it is a kind of strength. Uh, I'll, I'll and I'll end with this story. I um, I was at an event in Toronto, my native city. And I was seated beside a man who um, was the managing partner at a very important law firm in Canada. And he, uh, he showed me with, uh, he, he had told me that on the day after October, uh, the terrorist attack on October 8th, there had begun to be some rumblings from some of the junior associates at his firm about the usual stuff of recent college graduates. And he sent this memo round, signed with his name, about just this blistering thing as, you know, this is how the firm feels about these incidents. And if you are not comfortable, if you know, I've met some people have expressed discomfort to me with the firm's attitude. And the great news for them is there are lots of law firms hiring every day. Said, but at this firm, this is what I think. And this is what all my partners think. And I, and it was a very eloquent note, very powerful. Um, and I said to him, why did you do it? And he said, because he's got one of these classic Anglo Scottish Canadian names. Well, but he's connected in all kinds of ways, friendship, family, uh, to a community. He's, in a way, he's obviously super not Jewish, but yet he is emotionally connected to the Jewish people um, and cares about what happens. And I, I think that, th that those connections are, are real, are, are powerful, and much more powerful than is visible. For everything you see on TikTok and Instagram, there is someone who is, there are a hundred people who are like you and thinking, what jerks, what jerks? And every time they disrupt the traffic and say, I'm going to make somebody lose their job at a factory uh, because they missed their shift and the boss didn't listen to the explanation that it was some student from a university who caused them to do it. You know, th those people have reactions. Um, and anyway, so I, I, uh, uh, 
I don't know that there are a lot of explanations for the continued survival of the Jewish people other than divine protection because the rational explanations don't do the job. And but it, I, I'm not going to presume to understand those transcendental purposes, but um, for all that there has been suffering, there has also been um, this tremendous record of achievement in Israel, in the diaspora. And I, I believe the future will be better. Thank you. Wonderful. Again, thank you so much for being with us today, David Fromm, and uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.